Hello, universe. How are you today? Scott Menzel, trending in Hollywood. Episode, I don't know how many. Uh, we are back. Me and Dimitri Panos are here. And, 20. Uh, 20? It's, 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 are we at the big 2-0? We are, we are at the big 2-0. Yep. Whoa. Yep. Last week, wow. I believe, was 19. So that makes this 20. 20? That's 10 more than 10. Yeah. <laughs> And then when we're doing 30, when we turn 30, we're going to play the Bo Burnham song about 30, turning 30. You got it. <laughs> and then we'll do that. So we'll have that. Yeah. Um, Beautiful. But hey, uh, uh, we, we made it to uh, episode 20. Um, we made it to 20. <laughs> people said it everyone who, who watches it, we're done now. Like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> See ya. See hey, ya. next yeah. time, next next week will be 21. We can drink. <laughs> Uh, all right. So enough joking. Enough joking. No more fun on this show. Let's get down no to business, shall we? <laughs> the business of Hollywood. All right. So lots to talk about. Um, there's always, you know, it's funny, like, even though Dimitri and I, like, throughout the week, this is how the show works. And I think I said this before, is we, we sort of trade stories back and forth via text message. And, and some of them make it in, some of them don't make it in. Uh, and then some I just sort of like forget a lot about. And then I like scroll through the text and I'm like, oh yeah, we can put that one in there. That's so, what I do. <laughs> so I was kind of thinking of like, what should we include this week versus what shouldn't we include this week? And, uh, and uh, as I, as always, we want to like mix it up and kind of have a bunch of stuff. So one of the things that we haven't talked too much about on this show, but we want to um, kick this episode off is film festivals. And yes. we're, we're seeing this week, we, we have the celebration of the Tribeca Film Festival um, doing, again, a hybrid of a virtual versus a live in-person event. And then, of course, we have the the Cannes Film Festival coming up very soon, and and, and a lot of movies dropped about what's going to be premiering there. Um, which F9. of nine? What, what F nine? F nine. Like, <laughs> when you think of film festival, you think Fast and Furious. I yeah, mean, said F nine. <laughs> said no one ever. Perfect. Says no one. Ever. Oh, Except for Khan. <laughs> Yeah, except for France. <laughs> yeah, and especially when you think of France, you don't think yes. of Fast Nine. But they're like, well, we have Helen Mirren, and the French love Helen Mirren, so we got her. Yes. We got her. Yes. Um, so there's been a lot of um, sort of think pieces that have come out about the return of film festivals, and one of the ones that caught our eyes this week was this one um, from uh, Aaron Co. Uh, Aaron Cohen. And Ann Thompson over at IndieWire, film festivals prepare for a 2021 comeback. You know, can film festival tell tell your ride, and they aim to prove their worth. Right. So, um, Dimitri is kind of a newbie to film festivals. Mm -hmm. um, he, he, I've been he, aware of them. <laughs> you've but... been aware of them, but you only you've been to a couple like screenings for the virtual platforms at, at like Sundance and things of that nature. Yep. Mm -hmm. But you went to Toronto. I went to Toronto and I've been to when they had at the LA film festival. Um, but yes, Toronto was probably the biggest, best, uh, ex one of the biggest and best experiences I've ever had period straight up. So, so just so for, for those who haven't been to a film festival, and with it being like Toronto being your first really big festival, mm -hmm. what 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 was your takeaway? What was your what's your favorite aspects of that? Oh, and and I also have to mention too. I've also I've also been part of the Boston Film Festival, oh, which awesome. took place at Copley. So that was that that was fairly big. Um, the Toronto Film Festival for me was just a cornucopia of these various movies, some that might make it into a theater, some that might not, but you had a variety of movies to choose from and you were, you were for the most part surrounded by like-minded movie enthusiasts and fans, not just there to write about the business, but to celebrate film. 
uh, the city of Ty uh, Toronto, the, the very diverse, very kind and open city of Toronto, uh, it was it was a fantastic venue um, to go to. And look, you you see, it, it's Scott. Scott was my mentor. Scott and his wonderful wife Ashley uh, were my mentors in trying to design a schedule. And boy, what a schedule it was! You you <laughs> would be watching three, four, up to five movies a, a day. It's a lot of movie going, um, and there were a lot of theaters to traverse and go to. Um, but man, the electricity, the buzz, just being there. It was fantastic, uh, and I just loved every second of it, even during the bad movies uh, like The Lighthouse. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you also get to see Scott. You know, we, we got to see movies like Deer Skin, right, which I don't recall ever making a theatrical debut, but it has been on cable, like on the HBOs of the world. And I go, hey, I remember that movie. Um you know, I remember that movie from Toronto, A Bad Education, which I think I, I feel kind of got snubbed from a theatrical release, which ended up being on HBO, but a fantastic movie nonetheless. Um, what was the other? Oh, we saw Knives Out uh, in Toronto. And what a fantastic evening that was. So, Oh, I also saw Waves. I just saw so many movies, and some of them were uh, you might consider tentpole kind of movies, and then there were like great independent movies that otherwise I probably would have missed. But it's all around an electric atmosphere of people who love movies, and it was fantastic. Fantastic. One of the best experiences I've ever had. Thank you very much for coaxing me to go. Um, it was it was great. I, I just love the environment and the atmosphere. And Toronto, you were so right about Toronto. Toronto was just beautiful. What a great city to host this uh, such a fantastic festival. And they did a great job too. I know they've been doing it for years, so you would figure they kind of have the formula down pat, and they do. And it was so inviting, and I got to talk to so many people. Uh, in line while I was saving spots for you, <laughs> right? But I, I talked to so many people. Yeah, it was it was it was, uh, it was an amusement park of movies. It was great. Yeah, yes, uh, and uh, just just Yash comment on this, and this is this is very uh, true, and I think something that we should be celebrating is these great filmmakers that have come out of Canada. Um, not to mention yes. the the great actors like Mr. Marty Short, who came out of and Rick Moranis. So William I mean, Shatner. William Shatner. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> so um I, I you know, film festival. So 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 the reason why I, I picked this article was it was sort of like a a celebration, but also like a very harsh reality of something. Right. And, 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 and if you read this article and I highly recommend it, if you're someone who enjoys film festivals or mm -hmm. you're focused on the industry, it, it was basically sh talking about this pivot that was made because of the pandemic of right. film festivals, having to like kind of walk this tightrope of doing in person and also online. And, Again, to me, the reason why I love film festivals is the experience. Um, there is something so different. More, see, I will, I will go even further because, like, we know me and Dimitri have always had this conversation on this show about the theatrical experience versus watching something at home. And mm -hmm. you have heard me repeat things numerous times about this that I feel like there are certain movies that I really don't care if I watch at home and then other ones where I know I need to go to the theater. But to me, a film festival belongs in a theater. Um, yeah. It does, it does not, and, and it's part of that experience of seeing something for the first time with an audience who also sees it for the first time. Right. And experiencing that in, in like a Sundance where you know right. nothing about a lot of the titles or when you go to Toronto or Telluride and you're the first audience to see 
I don't know, like La La Land. Like, you don't know, like you saw the trailer, you're like, oh my God, it looks good. But you're in the room right. for the world premiere of La La Land with a bunch of people. And who knows, like filmmakers have no idea what people are going to react to. And there's nothing like that experience. Like, I, I mean, Agreed. I loved, again, we, we, we talked about um, film festivals, like Dimitri got to see Knives Out at the world premiere and then he got to go to dolomite right afterwards and he got to feel mm -hmm. that energy from both those movies and i think about um seeing a rival at at toronto and 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 also sometimes movies that have a disconnect with critics that audiences really like like i right. remember seeing life itself in uh -huh. toronto and a lot of critics hate that movie but if you were yeah. in that theater that night, you would think that you just watched the best. Like people loved it. Like they, there was a dis disconnect right. between audiences and critics for that one. And people really loved it. But I just, what I'm getting at is that the experience of a film festival cannot be replicated online at all. And in fact, you're right. I watch very few things at film festivals and like I even signed up for Tribeca and I kind of regret it because I took someone's spot of someone who would really want to watch it. And truth be told, I'm probably going to only watch one or two things because I have a plethora of options to watch on streaming and, and I'm right. not going to like, there's nothing special about watching an independent movie on there when I can watch a thousand other independent movies, even if it is the first time. But if I was there in New York, I would be eating this up and like bouncing from one movie to the next and probably talking. Agreed. Yeah. I mean, I get what you're saying uh, for sure. I'll, I'll be it. Last year, I understand why they went to the streaming. I mean, yes. come yes. on, you'd have to be an idiot not to, to, to realize why yeah. Yeah. many did that. Right. So uh, I consider myself fortunate because I did get to see my favorite movie of the year, Coda. And <laughs> um, yeah, I, I could say that I would miss, like, that would have been a great, great, great theatrical experience with a crowd because I do in my heart, honestly believe people would have been cheering and crying and sobbing all good tears and everything, but it, it, people would have really, that's the kind of experience you kind of get. Well, that's what, that's what the theatrical movie going experience is all about. And to your point, Scott, there is an electricity in the air um, about when you're in a film festival. In fact, I can <laughs> my my mind is working overtime now. I, I I could pretty much tell you the very first movie I saw at a film festival. It was the Boston Film Festival, and I saw the movie, the John Sales film Eight Men Out. Do you remember that yes. movie? Um, and. I, I enjoyed it. I, I like baseball. I wasn't too uh, up on what that story was, but I got to meet like so, so, some really cool actors who are in there. And I also uh, I also got to meet Robert Urich, who at the time was in Boston filming Spencer for Hire. So, um, but that was a film festival crowd and people ate the movie up. And there was a panel after. And... It was just such a, I don't know. You're right. The, there's just this electricity over it. And now I have to now I have to double check on IMDb. I'm pretty sure John Sales directed Eight Men Out, but it's been such a long time. Um, but you're right, Scott. There, there, there's an electricity. And sometimes you're right. There's a disconnect. You know, well, it's, it's, it's almost like a premiere. Yeah, it's, it's almost like a premiere. But I also feel like it's also um sort of like even if i don't like something i sort right. of like the vibe um it's it's yes. it's it, 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 it's weird right because there's a film festival and and, 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 I, and i will also say this that when i go to film festivals i 100% prefer going to the public and press ones like the ones that are like a combination of both because they mm -hmm. have like press only screenings and to me if i wanted to see a press only screening of something i would stay home 
I, I, right. I would literally go to the Rodeo screening room or Wilshire screening room or one of the theaters here where they were doing screenings and right. watch it there with the same people that I see movies with all the time. Right. When I go to a film festival, I want that community feel. I want right. that community vibe. And I want to see how others react to it. Yeah. I mean, this is, this is something that we've talked about at great lengths as well, is that you there's something about when you watch a movie and you feel like a weird disconnect towards it when you're in a, in a crowd, right? I, I mean, mm -hmm. I'll give you, I'll give everyone an example. I still to this day do not think Jojo Rabbit is that great of a movie. I, I know people love the movie. Oh, right. Mm -hmm. Loves the movie. I did. Um, Sorry to Toronto. Yeah. And we saw, that's yeah. why I'm getting it. That's what I'm pointing yeah. this out. Yeah. And I remember being in that theater and I remember the, you know, when it, when it ended and I just sort of said to myself, eh. And, and I remember, you know, and I was with Ashley and Ashley, like, I really liked it. And then we were walking back and you were like, I really liked it. And, and obviously the crowd really liked it. Um, yeah, it was like yeah. incredible, like applause and, and praise right. for it. And it was just, it was, it's fascinating because in those kind of environments, you almost, you wonder like, where was my disconnect with it? And then you like, you're almost searching for like that person, like, who else felt this way? <laughs> like, and you're like kind of in line and be like, oh, I saw, you know, next day you're like, oh, I went to the Jojo Rabbit premiere last night. Um, did you like it? Did you see it? And then like, you kind of find these common yeah. bonds with people who did, who <laughs> felt like the same way you, you did about it. Um, I, yeah. You know what my disconnect movie was yeah. uh, at Toronto? It was Hustlers. Oh yeah, dude. You, I know you do. You hated Hustlers. I can't even lie. Yeah. Hated Hustlers. See, oh, and I did. I did look it up. Uh, John Sales did direct uh, Eight Men Out, cool. so my memory is still with me for the time being. So, so yeah. I mean, I'm just. It, it's it's great to know that um, film festivals are coming back. But my 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 big reason for bringing this article up is the fact that my fear and my fear of this is is that because we made this transition to digital um, and the fact that film festivals cost money to put on mm -hmm. and that their focus over the last couple of years has sort of shifted away from the average person who lives in like the city of Toronto or the person who lives in Park City or all these areas where they take place to right. more of a media focus that they're going to try to limit the amount of media that comes there and give that back to the people who are going to spend money on the festival. And to me, it, it's sort of been an ongoing issue of what I felt with the progression of all these things happening. We, you know, right. Dimitri and I joked about how this, you just described Comic-Con and- And now Disney. And, and yeah, now Disney. Um, I mean Disney, di Disney parks, same thing. Yeah. So Get rid of the pass me, holders. My fear becomes, as someone who has supported the film festival experience and has climbed my way up to kind of earn my stripes to get certain types of badges and certain types of access. Right. I have a fear that my like work is now going to ripped be ripped from me and i'm going to right. basically be told that i have to do this virtually if i would like to participate in a festival that i would have to do this virtually and we will send sure. this up and to me that's not how it will be i mean the, the bottom line if that does happen is that i will choose a few festivals that i will go to and i will pay mm -hmm. for them right. but you can be sure as hell know that I am not going to cover something unless like right. I really, really want to cover it. Now I'll tweet about everything that I see and kind of have my initial reactions and everything the way I normally sure. do. But if I'm going to go there and if I have to pay my own way, which I don't mind doing, I know some people in the industry have a big issue with paying their way to do stuff. I have no issues doing it. In fact, I actually kind of enjoy it because I get to pick and choose what I want to cover. Mm -hmm. Um, I just will be very selective of what I'm going to actually cover. 
as right. opposed to like when I get a credential and someone asked me to do something and I sort of like assigned reviews out to people to write and things like that or myself, mm -hmm. it's going to be a lot more restrictive. But I'm just, I'm a little fearful of that moving forward well, because I think there was such a big shift where they let so many people in to all these things. Right, except except I, I didn't get into Toronto this year and it was all well, Toronto was the one. It's interesting. Toronto was a mess. Toronto, I didn't get into Toronto either. I paid for Toronto. Yeah. Um, right. Toronto was the weird one where they actually like declined everyone. Like they seem like they, they pick like a very small percentage, but after right. that got so much backlash, it seemed like every other festival, um, Sundance, AFI, South by like, they just, they were just like open the floodgates. Like anyone who applied, I mean, I literally saw people and I'm not trying to crap on anyone, but I've literally seen people who like have less than a year experience get approved to cover a major film festival like a Sundance. And like, to me, that blows my mind. It blows my yeah. mind. Yeah. Well, there's, there's, um, I want to go to the article for a sec because there are a couple of things that really jumped out at me. Um, one of them right here, uh, it says, uh, Tribeca quietly snipped film, the word film, uh, from its name. Yeah. That's, you know, the word film, it seems, is in danger of feeling archaic. Tribeca, I say, shame on you. Shame on you. Like, that's, that that's, you know, do not take this advantage of, of a pandemic. We sh you should be celebrating film and cinema that, and that you're able to show In the Heights. I don't care that In the Heights is showing it in a theater that projects digitally. We all get it. Yeah, but it's the Tribeca Film Festival. We didn't change it to the we, when, when there was the changeover from film to digital. You didn't change it over to call it the Tribeca Digital Movie <laughs> Festival. Yeah, you kept it. People get it. There's no like, yeah. What are you doing? I mean, that, shame on you. But later in that article, right? Uh, it's actually the paragraph right below it. Um, you know, it says festivals might be too. This is right after the line of uh, the word film, it seems, is in danger of feeling archaic. Festivals might be too. Late last year, most of them went virtual and became part of the streaming machine themselves. We were just talking about that. Meanwhile, traditional theatrical windows collapsed and people grew increasingly comfortable consuming entertainment at home. I counter that argument with, we didn't have a choice. <laughs> we didn't. Yeah. The option to go out was taken away from us. We couldn't go out. To say that we're comfortable at home, it's like saying, yeah, I'm comfortable at home watching my local news at CNN. Well, of course you are. We couldn't get out of the house. All the theaters were closed. I wrote an article about the collapsing of windows. Look, look. There was a lot of, and I'm not just talking about the theatrical world or the movie world. Uh, it's happened all over. You know, a lot of people took advantage, I'm going to say, of the pandemic to make it an opportunity for themselves. Yes. Something that they've been wanting to do, but they couldn't do in everyday life because, you know, status quo, people are used to this. But once the pandemic shut us down, people said, oh, Here's our here's our chance to do what we've been wanting to do. I, look, I'll I'll say it. I've been uh, I've been yelling for those who will listen. That's exactly what Disney did with its annual pass program. Okay, the parks were shut down, and Disney has been wanting to revamp uh, their pass thing. So they they got rid of it. Yeah, they, they got rid of it. Part. They didn't care. And to your point earlier, Scott, you know. Chappick, like publicly said, you know, I want to focus on the people who come here and stay at the parks for three to five days, who come and vacation here, rather than the the annual pass people who like will come to the park and maybe they won't consume as much. And I'm like, what the hell thinking is that? The annual pass people, you have those people for a year and they've already prepaid. You have their money. So yeah, we're, we're a pass holder may not spend Five, you know, as much as a person who's there for five days, 
they're going to spend throughout the entire year. It's this kind of mentality that has gripped Hollywood as well. And they used it to their advantage to collapse the windows so that they can make money. They didn't have the exhibitors best interest in mind regardless of what they might say now. And now I think that we're seeing these surges in box office, you know, and this is what I don't like about this, like, like this article, people are going to, people want to go back, give them material to see. Uh, and we're going to talk about one such movie, but they want to go back. And I think between a quiet place, Godzilla Kong, Conjuring 3. We didn't think Conjuring 3. We didn't think it was going to do as well as it did. Yeah. And so when you get a, even a mediocre movie that was debuting on HBO Max at the same time and people made it number one at the box office, there is an appetite for entertainment and consumption of entertainment outside of the house. I think people are tired of having to sit at a house and, um, yeah, I, I just think we're too quick. We're too quick to judge about this because we're not still fully open. And I think, I think film festivals do need to be careful as well. You know, the one thing, think about the last time we were in Toronto, right? Now think about add, the, <laughs> add, add, add COVID into that mix. Like Toronto was pretty packed wherever you walked. Yeah. Right. Could you imagine? Can you imagine thinking not vaccinated? Who's got COVID? It's COVID roulette. <laughs> roulette. <laughs> like who who's got it? And you're in a you're in a really filled theater. I don't think I went to one screening that was not packed. No, and of course not. Right. I mean, right. if, and if it's not, you know that the movie itself either is like completely like no one pushed it at all which i mean <laughs> or or like i i don't even know any other reason behind it because I, I i don't think i've ever been to an empty screening in a film festival i i, I nor a restaurant what nor an empty restaurant oh you know? yeah oh. <laughs> right so and what's what's the donut place over there the, their version of oh, tim tim Hortons. Hortons. yeah 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 tim, yeah there wasn't a there wasn't a, a an empty tim hortons anywhere either. So I think we really need to take stock of the fact uh, Tribeca cutting out film. I, I say shame on you, Tribeca, for doing that because it, it's a film festival, right? Yeah. I, I don't care that you have a streaming aspect to it. That's fine. And I get doing a hybrid. That's fine. You want to do it as safety. 2022 is going to be a different year. Pay attention. Yeah. yeah. Um, and also, let's not, you know, people grew increasingly comfortable consuming it at home. Well, they, again, you're going into the assumption like we had a choice. And right. I think pre-pandemic, box office and movies and everything shows that we like to go out, you know? Yeah. And so I think now that we're starting to expand and open more and more, you'll see that. And I think that film festivals... Like Toronto, they well, th there's a couple of things going on in Toronto because ever since you sent me that article, I've been reading about Canada and and, and Yash uh, uh, can 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 say can, can can back this up. Number one, he did say that theaters are still closed, which is crazy to me. For some reason, I thought they were opening, yeah, at least slowly. But I also hear that vaccination is moving at a glacier's pace up in Toronto or, oh, or in Canada. Yeah. So that is all going to have impact uh, going forward and going into Toronto Film Festival season. If Toronto is a hybrid this year, again, I won't be surprised. There are so many uh, things that I've been reading about in the trades, uh, not just film festivals, but music festivals that have pushed to 2022. Yeah. They've already kind of taken this year as a loss. Yeah. And, and you know what? I commend them for it. You want to get a feel. You, you know, you want to read the room and see how this is going to be. But my bet is, is that give it this year, we're going to have, but between now and December, we're going to have a great idea 
as to how our opening is. And I think it's going to spread throughout the world, the country. Next year will be more of that return to normal. Uh, but these festivals are doing a smart thing. Read the room. Yeah. By September, Yash says things will open up. That, that, that's September. Isn't that around the time of Toronto yeah, Film Festival? Yeah, actually the first, uh, the second week of September, I believe it starts this year because we mm -hmm. have a late Labor Day. Oh, that's right. I think it starts the second week because that's right. Usually, tell your ride is at the end of August, and this week it's actually at the first week of September. So it's it's the second week. They're um, in person yeah, this year, I'll right? Be, what? They're in person this year, correct? Tell your ride, tell your ride? in person. Yes. Um, I mean, they, I don't think they they would ever do um, because that again. That festival is is really about. I mean, I there's a lot of things that like people can complain about Telluride. Like it's very like, and I'll just say this: like it, it sort of has this like elitist type feel to it because you have to pay. There's no there's no way around it. Like it, it mm -hmm. press people. It's the it's the festival that makes press pay. Now I realize that there's people who work for great outlets who who get you know to go go for free because their outlet buys the press pass. But it's strange seeing the lack of press at Telluride because you have to pay for it. So right. it's ironic, like because there's like twenty five to thirty of us there. Right. Uh, because it's kind of like, I'm not paying for that. Um, <laughs> but to me, there's like this really great intimate feel that you right. get that the first year I was very skeptical about it. Like, and I was just uh, sort of like me and my, you know, me and Ashley went and I'm like, literally like the whole time all I'm doing is complaining about my, it's like, I paid this for this. I paid this for this. <laughs> and then I can I, imagine. And then I went the next, you know, the week after I go to Toronto. And I sent Toronto and I was like, wow, this is stressful. This is, this is stressful. There's a lot of people here. There's not as much access to talent. There's not a low key vibe to this. It's really hustle and bustle. It's like being in New York city, you're running around. It's constantly moving. Yeah. And then I had a change of heart when I went back to the telly right the next year, because I was kind of like, this is sort of like, a movie lover's paradise. You're okay. in this beautiful small town. You get to walk around town and you're like, oh, look, there's Taylor Russell on the street. Hey, Taylor Russell, how are you? You're going to have breakfast? Oh, Adam Sandler, how are you, Adam Sandler? I'm going to go eat in this breakfast place too. You want to come eat? You're like, it's like <laughs> that kind of environment where you're just sort of just, you're in the moment and it feels very much like a vacation. Mm -hmm. and just like access to everyone. I mean, I'll, I'll re I regret this because I still to this day have not met Hugh Jackman. And I was at Telluride when the front runner came out and he was out in the lobby and like a whole bunch of people were surrounding him and talking to him. And like, again, anyone can walk up to him. And I was like, I'll, I'll probably see him around town, like somewhere. And he was like the only person in that year I didn't see around town ever again. So I missed my chance to meet. He vamoosed. <laughs> yeah, I, well, no, he was there, but I guess because he was working on so many different projects, oh, that, like, oh. he was like in hotels, kind of like making calls and doing stuff. Right. But like I would see Jason Reitman, he would be at everything. And, and I was like, damn, where is he? But it's a great experience. And it just, it, it's, it's the one festival where you really do feel like you can decompress. Like you go to a movie, then you have a nice dinner and then you go to another movie and it doesn't feel like there's a rush when you're at all the other festivals. It's kind of like Sundance. You're like, hum, hum, hum. Oh, Oh my God, I gotta get in line. I gotta get in line. Toronto is kind of the same way. Like, ah, do kind I of the same time. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, we made time. We we had like we ate at that good Italian restaurant. We you know, but then there were there were certain parties that we were able to get into, and we yeah. went to some pubs. And I guess I just love the vibe of Toronto. Uh, Telluride sounds fun. I may pony up someday. Uh, you know, to to bother you guys and 
because uh, I would go, Adam Sandler, hey! <laughs> you know, yeah. That's like, totally what happens. Like you roll, you're really walking down the street and you like, we'll see someone and you're just kind of like, oh, there's Adam Sandler across the street. And like <laughs> so, you come up to them and like, it's also different because it's not like as fan based. Like when you right. go to regular film festivals, I feel like there's a lot of like selfies uh kind oh, of oh, yeah, 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 yeah. where like at you just sort of like embrace the moment when you're there and you're sort right. of like wow i just had like a random five minute conversation on the street with this person and you're right. like just there um and you live in the moment more and i guess again maybe that's the difference is that it's such a um a contained environment right that everyone feels um really like I don't know, just just in in the in the moment, right. and and I love that because I feel like everything else is sort of like in the moment where like I have to capture this on my device. I have to have yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. So, uh -huh. Well, you know, I just think that again um, with Tribeca doing what it's doing, it's 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 hybrid. Uh, it, 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 there's no need to cut out film. No. I say, okay, Tribeca, you know. In all film festivals, for that matter, it's like I said, read the room. Let's pay attention to what's going on this year. Let's pay attention to the movies that are coming out. Um, I believe that there's going to be a lot more of fantastic product uh, to be available in 2022. And yeah, I think that there'll be film this year. So, yeah, there's going to be. Yeah, even more so I think there's going to be a hunger to go to these film festivals and to be part of of that energy. So, I mean, now from a film festival point of view, if they want to have streaming uh, uh, going forward, I, I can't necessarily deny that because it gets more viewers. It gets more eyeballs on product. And to, <laughs> To your words, Scott, it's a new world. <laughs> we have to embrace <laughs> streaming. Um, I get it. But let's not forget the film and film festivals, that these are these are movies. Um, it, in, many, in, in, in many occasions, uh, it could be a, a, a young producer or a young director, and he gets invited. I mean, there's that excitement, too. Yes. There's excitement for the creatives. You know, finding to, that to, filmmaker who like breaks out from there. Yeah. Correct. And because he gets invited, his film is invited into the festival. And to have a Toronto film festival, you know, inclusion, that's huge. That's, that, that's great for the business card. You know, it's great for his poster. It's great for his film reel to be able to add the Toronto film festival or the Sundance F F film festival uh, logo onto their credentials. So, yeah, um, we need to just let it breathe. Yeah. Let's absolutely. not rush to make these huge changes because it's going to end up biting you. I agree. Um, yeah. So we're going to we're going to shift now gears um, to uh, our, our Netflix news of the week, uh, because we obviously there's always Netflix news. And always there is uh, the first surprise that I think both me and Dimitri were very shocked when we read this story. And that is, of course, is this. Um, Tyler Perry's Medea returns and jumps to <laughs> Netflix. Crazy. Now, for, for any, I mean, obviously within the industry, you know that there's a huge disconnect between critics and audiences for anything Tyler Perry. I think it's pretty safe to say anything that he directs, writes, there is a huge divide between how critics react to it and how traditional audiences react to it. He has okay. a huge following, um, not only with his TV shows and movies, but as his stage plays. And this is the inevitable, right? We 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 um, we knew that Medea technically wouldn't be over. It's it's sort of like what Tyler Perry became known for in mm -hmm. his film. Mm -hmm. The film franchise has been widely popular. Widely popular, insanely popular. Just when you, you can, just when you think it won't be, it is. Yeah, exactly. So to me, you know, this was this was the shocker of this news is that Lionsgate is losing this 
I mean, IP. This is a to me, this is a profitable and valuable IP because mm -hmm. you can literally make this till the sun comes home and make different versions and story like television series and everything. And now that it goes to Netflix, you know Netflix is going to take full advantage of it. So this movie is just the beginning of a much larger deal that's going to happen. Yeah, and I can speak. Uh, I can speak from experience of this, Scott, because yeah. I was at Lionsgate working through the theatrical distribution department when, when, when um, the, the the people, uh, a gentleman by the name of Mike Passanak, I'll give him credit. He's the guy that that shepherded and brought Tyler Perry into the fold, so to speak. Now, a little bit of history, if that's okay. Um, the reason why Tyler Perry wanted to start uh, make a film deal, okay, he wanted to make a deal with the studio. Why? Because uh, his stage plays, uh, which were immensely popular wherever he went, sellouts for, for days on end, um, they were being pirated. People would uh, record them, and then they'd go and sell them on street corners. And obviously, and, and, and it was a huge, it became a very huge issue. So he wanted to make a deal with the studio uh, so that he could make movies, distribute movies, but distribute. He could record his own plays if he wanted to and have the studio uh, distribute the, the DVD or Blu-ray, right? So he wanted control. He wanted to stop the piracy of, 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 of his plays. Um, Diary of a Mad Black Woman was the first movie that Lionsgate did, and it was the movie in which educated Lionsgate truly, outside of Mike Pasternak, who, God bless him, he he knew he knew that this guy was the real deal. We knew uh, from a de from, from in the distribution department that this guy was the real deal. Um, we had for the first time ever set up uh, an advanced uh, ticketing website. Okay, so that people can come on in. Um, we wanted theaters to also do private or, or like private screenings. Ton of church groups, man. Ton of church groups bought out screenings for 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 his movies. The very first day that this uh, advanced ticketing website went live, it crashed within thirty minutes. Crashed because so many people were coming on board. Um, and then Dire of the Mad Black Woman came out. It did really well. Uh, and then we did our first Medea movie. And that, again, went through the roof. And he had what, what I believe was a very uh, lucrative. And he had, a, he had a great run. Lionsgate had a great run with, with Tyler Perry. And, and to your point, uh, Scott, I recognize like the Tyler Perry movies, a lot of them, they weren't made for, 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 for the likes of me, but it didn't matter. I, I understood. I, I got it. I, I, and it's, oh, it's great. I think that audiences can gravitate and like something that's, that's not harmful <laughs> at all. Uh, it does. It did great for the community. Uh, like I said, so many church groups, were people that bought tickets to these things. They were part of the reason of sellouts in the opening weekends of his movies. They were church groups. They were buying advanced tickets. They were buying out a house, and they were able to fill the house. Not a problem. Tyler Perry, when I used to, uh, I, I used to say of Tyler Perry, when I used to do presentations, like, he was the hardest working man in show business. This guy was writing directing, acting, and then he's working on other projects. He's working on other stage plays. He could be doing a stage play, and then he'd go film a movie. The, the man is a dynamo. He's a work horse. He's got great work ethic, To you know what I'm saying? And Mano Manischewitz, for it to go to Netflix, that to me is crazy because I believe there's, I believe there's so much box office that is not going to be accrued. That's going to be left on the table. I think with the return of Medea, the marketing's baked in. <laughs> I mean, it's an easy marketing thing. <laughs> I mean, Medea's back. <laughs> and, you know, we, we thought she was dead, but he's, she's back. And I don't know. I, I don't know how you 
monetize that for Netflix. Um, it's great for Netflix because they're going to get so many eyeballs, man. It's going to be insane. And I'm sure Tyler Perry made a fortune off the deal. But, man, I just think... I just think of the dollar, the, the box office dollar signs that are lost. And, and it's it's actually too bad because it, for the Tyler Perry audience, it really was an event. It was a gathering. You know, when church groups go together to see a Tyler Perry movie, that's a gathering. That is the movie going experience. Now they just get to stay at home. There's no theater that they can rent out. I mean, I guess they could watch it at church. Um, but yeah, I, I, yeah, I, good for Tyler Perry. It's just, I just think, wow, I wish somebody, somebody should have had, if Lionsgate wasn't going to do it, you would have think you would have thought that Paramount, somebody would have come in to try to get him to come on board, but you know, oh, well, good for Netflix. Yeah. Um, I mean, I have nothing to add to that. I mean, I just, I mean, I agree with you. I think it's, it's a shame because to, to, to me, whenever, I mean, I'll never forget when I saw a diary of the mad of, of a mad black woman in theaters, I, I had no idea what it was. And I was living in Covina at the time oh. and I bought a ticket at the AMC right there. And I lived like a mile away from it. And I went to see it. And the theater was packed. And I'm like, how have I not heard of this? Like, what it like, why is this so popular? And I and I and again, I found my I surprisingly enjoyed the film. And I and I and I found that this movie and that this 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 marketing of this movie and this character and the stories that was being told by this character connected with an audience that was surrounding me in a theater. And, and mm -hmm. to me, I had, obviously there's a huge disconnect with the way that I connected with this versus the others in the theater. Mm -hmm. And as time has kind of gone on and I've sort of like listened to all, again, people within our industry, like the disconnect of like, Oh my God, there's another one of these. Like, can they put a fork in it? I'm so tired of this, you know, not realizing that everything is made for you. Like not everything is made for you. <laughs> there is literally a group of people who live, breathe yes. and yes. die by these types of things. And it, it's, yes. you know, I'm going to talk about this in a few minutes when I talk about meet the blacks um, briefly, you know, Dion Taylor and I had a conversation on Monday night where he said, it's for the culture. It's for, it's for the community. Yeah. And we, as, critics sometimes don't understand that just to, that because we don't like something doesn't mean that someone else isn't uh, scott 100 percent. you're 100 percent. But, but but i want to add to what you're saying again just from the 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 experience i had at lionsgate you know tyler perry tried extraordinarily hard yeah to cross over Okay, he 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 didn't want he wanted he wanted cross culture coming in. He didn't want to just make it for this audience. And he tried and he he got some big name actors in some of his later movies. He got he big name white actors and he did that for a reason. And you know what though? Those actors they jumped at the opportunity to work with Tyler Perry. Okay? So for the people who keep on saying, oh, no, another one of these, nine out of ten, they probably haven't seen his library of work. You know, I, I got to see it because I was at Lionsgate, so I went to screenings and whatnot. Um, you just understand. And, yes, some movies re resonated more with me than, say, others, but that's okay. That is absolutely okay. Just because it doesn't resonate with me, all I could recognize is that the people around me were yelling at the screen, laughing out loud. And I, and that's when I go, yeah, I get it. I get it. And so your words ring so true, Scott. It's like, they don't have to make the movies just for me. I, I should be able to go and hopefully I'll enjoy it. But if I don't, that's fine. I'll write about it. 
but the audience that was there enjoyed it. I mean, Jesus Christ, how many kitty movies do they make? That I, I know that audience. I, I know that movie ain't made for me, and I don't like it. Yeah, right? grumpy, and complain. Oh, another one of these. But no, they're made for kids, and, and you got to understand that. Tyler Perry desperately, well, desperately is the wrong word. Tyler Perry worked very hard to get as many people, no matter what their race was, to see his movies. He really worked hard at that. And he tried, and he and he continues, I think, to do so today. Yeah. So um, kudos. Uh, I was fortunate to work at Lionsgate because it actually, it opened up my eyes. L like you, I didn't know who Tyler Perry was. I, I didn't go to his stage plays. I didn't know who this Medea character was. But lo and behold, after Diary of a Mad Black Woman, man, it changed. Uh, <laughs> and it changed. It changed. It changed the culture. And, and I think it gave movie-going audiences some great stuff. We were better educated as to how to release the movies. And let me tell you one other thing. You know who else? And this is what this is what kind of makes me a little bit sad, too, that it's going to Netflix. Exhibitors loved Tyler Perry. Say this one more time. Exhibitors, a.k.a. movie theaters, loved Tyler Perry. Perry. There were certain theaters that would play his movies for 12 weeks. They're like they would run for a long time. They were thankful when we were coming out with a Tyler Perry movie. And they loved him. And let me tell you, Tyler Perry embraced that experience. I, I it's like I said, good for Netflix, good for Tyler Perry. I'm sure he made a fortune. I'm just kind of bummed uh, because that dynamic yeah. uh, is, 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 is um, shifted. Yeah, I feel you. Um, yeah. Switching over to another Netflix story, uh, <laughs> Jennifer Lopez, which, which again, Woo! there's two things, to, <laughs> two things to kind of point out again about something that we have said on this show before is that Netflix is no – stranger to embracing diverse projects and really True. kind of putting their money where their mouth is when it comes oh, to being inclusive. Um, and I think these two deals alone prove that, you know, obviously Jennifer Lopez is a huge um, inspiration in the Latino community. And mm -hmm. this deal for her, you know, this is a production deal. It's not, it's not just like we're getting a Jennifer Lopez movie where we're signing oh, yeah. products that, she is going to want to produce and, and stand uh -huh. behind. And um, this is a major, a major win. I think another major win for her. I mean, if Adam Sandler can have a deal on Netflix, it's nice to know that Taylor, uh, Tyler Perry is going to be able to get one. And Jennifer Lopez is going to get one too. Sure. And, and again, I will say, I am not the biggest Jennifer Lopez fan period. <laughs> yeah. uh, no, so, and so, uh, it, again, it's great for those two parties. I think it's great for it's great for the Netflix audience. Yeah. Um. So it, it's just crazy. Like her trajectory in Hollywood is just <laughs> it really is crazy to me. Oh, I don't yeah. know how she Starting did off it. as a fly girl on In Living Color to what right. she's been it, able to make. And and as much as I dislike her, look, I, I say this of any talent uh i may not like your music i may not like your movies but out of your entire catalog i'm willing to bet yeah there's probably one or two movies i think you're a good in and so i give her selena and i give her this um i give her the the the, the soderberg movie she did with george clooney out of sight yeah those two movies okay you were really good made in manhattan <laughs> Her other movies, I'm just not a fan. Just not a fan. Um, and she made a lot of clunkers. It's amazing how she's persevered uh, as an actress, and now she's a producer. And she's produced for a little while, but I mean, this deal for net with Netflix is fantastic. Netflix continues to shell out money, 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 where nobody else will. So yeah, it's it's good for them, good for the both of them, and good for Tyler Perry. 
It's crazy. It's very crazy. So real but, quick before we go. Yeah. Oh, I, no, I wanted to also before. talk because this is another Netflix thing. Lynn manuel Miranda's directorial debut is going to be on Netflix. Oh, yeah. Jesus. The trailer so for much, that. Yeah. Oh, my. Okay. Okay. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about this real quick. Yeah. yeah. So, so <laughs> Tick, Tick, Boom. Yeah. Which is about the creator of Rent is the trailer dropped the other day. And it was yeah. funny because it came the day after a trailer dropped for another Andrew Garfield movie. And all I can tell myself is that <laughs> now they got him going for supporting actor for this movie. <laughs> and then he's going to go for a lead actor with this one. And I just thought like, what, like what he wants a lot of gold this year, apparently. Right. Yeah. Uh, what you again, that trailer real quick. I, look, musicals are hot right now. I mean, there's just no denying it. Yeah. Between what we had this year, uh, Valley Girl, uh, what was the prom? Yeah. Uh, now we've got In the Heights. Um, Dear Evan um, Hansen, West, West, Dear Side Evan Hansen West Side Story. West Side Story. I, I got to be honest, again, kind of surprised that Lin-Manuel Miranda is first thing, not going theatrically. I don't understand. I don't get it. I don't get what Hollywood is all about here. Um, it, I, I don't get it. It's on. It's going to be on Netflix. The trailer looked solid. I, I mean, I'll watch it. It looked good. And it's on Netflix, so I'll, I'll give it a shot. I'll, I'll give Andrew Garfield a shot. I mean, <laughs> why not? It, but I'm also curious to see Miranda's directorial. Like, yeah. I want to see a feature-length movie from him. And yeah, I so uh, I'm in. I just wish I could. I, I wish it were theatrical. Yeah, um, I don't understand why people just wouldn't have given them the shot to do it. You know. So uh, I, I again, mean, another he's, Netflix he's deal. Such, he's proven to be such a bankable name <laughs> that it's <laughs> like it sort of like makes no sense, right? Like it's like no, a dude who has created Hamilton wants to do something. Like to me, it's like okay. You get a chance. Like, if you have like five or six flops, then like maybe I reconsider it. But to me, what he did for <laughs> the world of Broadway, I mean, it's just amazing. I mean, he like he really, you know, he reinvented it and he brought culture to what honestly is appreciated by white people and Jews. I, mean, right. I make this joke, but it's true. Like there's literally every stage play makes a joke about Jews and how, you know, Jews. Uh, uh, right. But it's true. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and the other thing though, is that Disney kind of embraced him. Yes. Right. Yes. So didn't he co-write music for Moana? Yes, he did. Right. Okay. And so was right there. Little Mermaid, and he has his own right. thing that's coming out with them soon, which he can't, like, right. literally no one has been talking about, but it's like coming out right. in the Thanksgiving this and, year. It's going to probably be a huge hit. Yep. And Mary Poppins, he was in Mary Poppins Returns. I think uh, he did gonna, as well for that. Yep. And um, I know we're going to talk in the Heights, which I think is going to actually be, I think it's going to do really well. Um, so I just don't understand. <laughs> like, I don't get why nobody would pick. Did they think that the subject matter to tick, tick, boom um, might not resonate? Uh, all you need to do is Lin-Manuel Miranda's name yeah. on it. Um, but the other thing too is maybe, maybe Lin-Manuel Miranda was kind of hedging his bets. If it, if it flops on Netflix, Meaning, what is, I yeah, don't know. People don't like it. At this point, anyhow, right? Like, what? What maybe is people, on Netflix? Maybe people don't like it, like, or or, or maybe it gets mediocre reviews. And I, again, this is nothing against the man. I haven't seen the movie, but I'm just saying. I, I'm saying hedging his bets. If it's on Netflix, you can escape that. But if it's theatrically, you really can't because his name is already so big. It, it's kind of like Bradley Cooper. With the star is born. Yeah. Had it gone the other way, I mean, he he happened to make a fantastic movie, okay? But had it gone the other way, woof. Yeah. Because his name was everywhere on that movie. As you know, Lin-Manuel Miranda's name would have been everywhere on this movie. It's a lot would be riding on it. And and had it been received poorly, 
So maybe, hey, I'm going to get the money. I get to hedge my bets. We'll see if people like it. Uh, and then if people like it, Hollywood will take notice and his next directorial will, will more than likely be theatrical. Yeah. It's a guess. It's a guess. But he's taken risks all his life in the Heights is proof. Okay. And we're so, just going to segue right into In the Heights. So to me, the- I, I obviously have not talked to you about In the Heights. Nope. Um, you, you, you saw it yesterday. I did. Uh, I, I'm going to put the spotlight on you. Sorry. Thoughts. Okay. Uh, in the Heights to me, um, kind of a mixed bag. Okay. I, I don't believe that the first half, uh, necessarily lives up to the first. I mean, the second half, forgive me. The second half doesn't necessarily live up to the first half of the movie. Why? The first half of the movie is so energetic, so exuberant, so charged. Um, you know, you realize why, uh, you know, a smile uh, is so, can be infectious, right? I found myself the first half of that movie, wow, surprisingly so into this movie and I was smiling and I got charged up. It was, it felt good and I saw it in IMAX. And then I felt that the middle of the movie kind of like puts the brakes on and kind of slows down. Now, the second half does valiantly uh, attempt to capture all that energy uh, in the first uh, half of the movie. There's that Carnival uh, Day, um, what is it? Carnival Day Bodega. There's the Carnival song that has that energy. And then, of course, there's the showstopper, the visually stunning. Best way I can describe it is uh, Fred Astaire meets Spider-Man dance that I thought was just beautiful. Um, The movie embraces culture. The movie embraces family, friendships, love. Um, It embraces a neighborhood. Uh, and, 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 And like I said, it embraces a culture in such a beautiful, loving way. I was thinking to myself, usually when we see a movie like this, there's usually a villain there's really no villain in this movie. Like this isn't like a West side story kind of thing. These are all about Latinos, but various Latinos, uh, whether you're from the Dominican Republic or Cuba or Cuba, it, it was, Oh, there goes that thing again. I might have to shut my front door. Uh, I hear that truck, but you know, I found it to be, I really enjoyed it a little bit more than I thought I was going to. And then it resonated with me a different way, which I'm going to go into when I do my full review of the movie. And that resonated to my, my, well, I I thought about my wife a lot because this movie, Scott, I think you would agree. This movie was about people who were dreamers, right? Yeah. And it was about people who had a dream and because of the G word gentrification, so to speak, they would be kind of being forced out of this neighborhood, this neighborhood of, of family, of friendships. Um, and, but these people wanted to aspire. Um, the people who worked in the salon, they wanted to continue going on. Uh, you, you had the lead character, uh, uh, and he wanted to fulfill a dream of his daddy's land in the Dominican Republic. And they were all people, some of them weren't like citizens, so to speak. And all I can think about is how this movie resonated with me through my wife, because she is one of the, she was one of those people who came to the country and uh, the abuela had this amazing song when she talks about moving to the country, moving to New York and going into Washington Heights and not speaking a word of English, but having to learn English. Like she became part of the community, you know, uh, 
and that was my wife. And my wife had made something of herself and she worked hard. She went to school, she got into college and she had a lot stacked up against her that I won't get into now, but you know, she worked her way up to becoming head of marketing and I'm, and I'm watching these people in this movie and all I could think about was my wife's dream and what she endured. And that to me resonated in my heart. And it's sort of kind of like a second review for me. So ultimately, even though it's a mixed bag, the movie, run, the, the movie runs a little long. Oh, yeah. Um, there's a couple there. There's a couple in the movie where their, their arcs aren't quite fully realized. <laughs> fully realized. Yeah, well, exactly. I was kind of surprised because we spent a good, good amount of time with them. And yeah, we don't know what really became of them. And that to me is a missed opportunity. It was sad. With all those misgivings, um, I have to look at the positive that that movie did. Scott, there were two girls, two little girls in the theater, I saw it at AMC Century City IMAX. Yeah. Was still doing social distancing, right? Yeah. These girls couldn't have been older than seven years old. More than more than three songs, they were dancing in the aisles. Yeah. Like, dancing I mean, I, in the aisles. You saw that Sorry. you saw that video that John M. Shu posted yesterday about like the people in the theaters like dancing. Like, I mean, no, I didn't see like, that. To me, to me, this is uh, I, I, let me let me go into my my thing real quick. So, yes, please, please. All right. So sorry, I have no never. This is like a a really world winning kind of experience for me because hmm. I saw In the Heights on Broadway, and I'm going to be completely transparent and honest about this. I saw it. I was not impressed. I don't. I actually didn't think of. of anything about it until the movie was announced. And then when I saw the movie was announced, I said, oh my God, I saw that on Broadway. And then I was like, oh, oh my God, I saw that <laughs> with Lin-Manuel Miranda, like before he became Lin-Manuel Miranda, like before he became a household name. Wow. And then I was okay. thinking about that and I was kind of like, was it, did I see that too early in my Broadway days? where like I didn't appreciate it, like where I like kind of mm. like didn't really have an appreciation. Like you're when you watch things, whether it's a Broadway show, whether it's a TV show, whether it's a movies, the more you watch of something and the more you see different types of stories, the more you build appreciation for it. So Correct. my initial thoughts of, of In the Heights was sort of like, that was fine. Um, not realizing what that story meant to the Latino community at the time. And again, mm -hmm. maybe before it's time, which is why it wasn't that huge of a hit. Like it wasn't in the Heights was not a huge Broadway smash like Hamilton was. Right. That being said, when I watched the movie, I started having <laughs> flashbacks to the Broadway play. And I was like, oh yeah, I remember this. Oh yeah, I remember this. And I, I walked away from the movie and I kind of had this sort of like, I liked it, but I didn't love it. Mm -hmm. And I felt bad for not loving it. But then I go back to the conversation that we had 20 minutes ago about Tyler Perry and I say it is not made for me this to me this is not a movie there are plenty of musicals that are made and geared towards me and I really love them mm -hmm. and I appreciate them sure that I am like the biggest like non-fan supporter of in the heights because like <laughs> I know what this movie means to people and like, I want to see it like make that. so much money because I know it's like what I believe in and what I fight for. It's a non franchise movie. That's about a culture that is so properly represented on screen that Absolutely. no one gets to see. And, and I want to, I want to raise this movie up and do like everything I can to support it. Yet at the same time, like I'm like, but, I'm kind of like on the fence about how I feel about it, but yet I know the importance <laughs> of it. Well, it's the weirdest feeling to have. And I've had this I, feeling and I haven't been able I to talk it. about it for like 
three months now. <laughs> and, and, I, and, and you're like, you literally go on my Twitter and you're probably like, man, this guy uh, loves In the Heights. And the truth is I don't really love In the Heights. I like In the Heights, but I love what it stands for and what it could do for a community. Um, and that's what I'm letting run my review with, Scott. Because, okay, the romance, the main romance I find, I found to be trite. Yeah. I found it to be trite. And like I said, there was that other romance that just, it never, it never goes anywhere. Like it yeah. never blossoms into anything. But I did appreciate, look, the opening was fantastic. Um, you, uh, oh, the, 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 the pool scene. Oh, no, that's what everyone's talking about. 96,000. Yeah. 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 96,000. 96, oh, yeah. I mean, again, you, when you're sitting in a movie theater, it's, it's so infectious and you could tell everybody part of the project loved being part of the project. The smiles on people. I, it was infectious. Like I said, I was smiling. I was like, yeah. And the way that it was filmed too, it wasn't like cut with a jigsaw. Yeah. This thing was like precisely filmed. They knew exactly I, I how to it do shows, it. I, I think it shows John M. Chu like how much <laughs> range he has as a filmmaker. I mean, people don't like <laughs> them in the holograms. But like, if you look at some of the shots in Gem and the holograms and the cinematography, there's some yep. brilliant freaking like filmmaking in that movie. Yeah. That like, yeah. yes, the, the story itself is not that great and very generic, but like, his yeah. visual style is just great. Yep. And I loved the fresh faces. I loved seeing these people who I've not really seen a lot of before. Anthony Ramos as as. Uznavi uh, was great. I love Leslie Grace. Uh, this Melissa Barrera was beautiful as Vanessa. Uh, I, I said, I'm going to mention Leslie Grace because she too was just, there was so captivating. And they, 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 my Brady agrees with me 100%. <laughs> um, this Corey Hawkins kid was, was really good. And I love the Gregory Diaz the fourth as Sonny. Yeah, he was like, you know, and he wasn't an annoying kid. He a little smart mouthed a little, but he he, he added levity. Uh, he could sing. Um, man, I whatever negatives I have about the movie, I push them down and go ahead and say, you know what, I, I can't give it the high five, but I, I'll give it four. I, I'll give it four uh, fingers. Just because of its representation, and I love it. It's so Hollywood sometimes is so stuck on oh, like getting star power. Yep, yep, yep. There's a great article I think in today's Hollywood Reporter about why it took a decade to get this movie into theaters to get it made, and many studios said, "Well, you know, you need to hire Jennifer Lopez." That's not what this movie's about. And I love the fact that I had such fresh faces. You could make a good movie with virtual unknowns in the movie world and still make it work really well. And this is a great example. That the grandmother who everyone is talking about, which is something yes. that I think Olga is very, Yeah, mm -hmm. this is something that I think is very important to bring up. We always have, whenever a Broadway musical comes out and it's made for the big screen, there's always like this, like it's like always comes out. Why did not they cast the Broadway actors in the movie? There's always that conversation that happens. Right. The grandmother right. is actually the grandmother from the 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 play. Uh -huh. so I think that's that's great to point out, and and she translates well into the the film. Oh, but beautiful. I also wonder if they did an all Broadway cast. I, it, people don't seem to understand. There's a disconnect, and it's a different process to be in a film versus a Broadway show. It's it's a yes. completely different avenue. It's a di it, There's a different level of expectations and everything else. So there's a fine art to it. And there's obviously a lot of other reasons that have been discussed a million times over, but I just thought it was refreshing to actually see someone from the show actually make their way over to the movie. Yeah. And she, you know, she's a major heart of the, the film. The biggest name that I recognized, and, and this is just me, was Jimmy Smits. And yep. I thought it was the best thing that he's done in a long time. The actor, you know, in a movie, he was he was fantastic. Um, you believe that, that's why I say there were no villains. 
There were no bad street gangs in this movie, right? This wasn't a West Side Story, right? which is its own movie, but a movie that takes place in a neighborhood, you know? I really embraced the positivity that that came from this movie, and I forgive it its flaws, and there are flaws. Two and a half hour runtime. <laughs> well, I, I kind of felt it. I'm not going to lie. Yeah, no, no, I, you you totally feel. It. Listen, that's. I, I mean, I feel as much as I love the prom. There's a there's a point in the prom where the prom hits a a, a low for about ten to fifteen minutes. Yes, uh, and it's it's also there's not someone has not understood this about the adaptations from 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 Broadway to um, film is that you don't get an intermission with a film. No. So right. like to me, I always know again, and this is my love of Broadway. Like when I watch a movie, I'm like, that's when an intermission happened, and this is where there's going to be a low in this movie. Right. Yeah. Um, and yeah, they where did the inter- that. They gotta work on Do- that. Do you remember when the intermission happened in the Heights play? Do you remember it all? I'm pretty sure it was right next to 96,000. Really? I could, I could be wrong. So it wasn't near, it wasn't around, it wasn't during the blackout. I would have thought it might have been during the blackout. You might actually be right about that. Hold on, I'm going to actually look it up because I'm sure someone you does are, say okay. it. Because uh, you are 100% right. I am wrong. And I it, didn't even it, see it, the play. It, it didn't happen during, right after the blackout, which makes sense because it's fade to black. They can do it. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, and that was around the time uh, things started to slow down. The energy slowed down. I mean, I remember uh, I had to get up um, and I looked at my watch and it said four o'clock and I thought it was mistaken. <laughs> I thought it was, I thought it was, I go, no, 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 no. My watch must have stopped. It should be five o'clock. We got to be almost done here. And then yeah. I'm like, I got another hour of this. Like I said, there are a couple of great set pieces in that second half of the movie. Um, that well, were when visually. Culture, when, when, when everyone in the neighborhood reunites for that musical number. Yes. I mean, listen, I felt that emotionally that yes. I cannot even imagine what a person whose culture this is representing yes. feels like watching that scene. Because it's just it's it's such a powerful and emotional moment mm. as everyone kind of figures out the next stage of what their life is going to be, uh, yeah. just just really great. All right, yeah, we'll so move on to this real go. quick. I just want to say two things. Um, you know, one of my favorite network shows was uh, Axe this mm. week, and it's uh, Zoe's extraordinary playlist. Um, just to throw this out there, um, again. Just looking at this poster, you, you you get to see like there's again representation. Again, Hollywood loves to talk about this stuff, and yet you have a show that's highly reviewed, has a huge fan base, and is is literally has made episodes that focus on representation. You have a trans character in this show. You have a storyline that goes on about Simon being the only black person at a at his company, and how he's gonna create like a whole new unit and yet here we are they canceled the show um i want to play this quick little clip i did a right before this show i actually did a interview with the choreographer uh mandy moore who is uh very passionate she's been on the show since the very beginning and chore you know choreographed all the dance moves and i i asked her at the end of the interview i said what can we do to save zoe's playlist and how she heard about the news and just want to share this with everyone the cancellation, how did you find out? And and just to end this, like, what can we as fans do to support this, find this show a new home? Well, I mean, Austin called me on Monday. It was devastating. And he just said that NBC and Peacock had passed. And obviously it's just a gut punch, you know? You kind of prepare yourself because we hadn't heard something for a while, but you just think that's not possible. We have such a huge fan base and, you know, it's critically, people are loving it critically. So I... You know, I think as fans, I think it's like reaching out. I mean, I don't know. Like, how do you get to Netflix and say, hey, this needs to be on Netflix or hey, Hulu, it needs to be here. But I think it's continuing this social media push. That's a huge thing in our world right now. Twitter and Instagram and TikTok. I mean, and tagging the different streamers. Like, that's all I can think. 
or we need to do like a big flash mob and go down like a Hollywood <laughs> Boulevard, like save Zoe's, you know, I don't know. <laughs> but hopefully we do find a place. Cause I know for me, I'm not done. Like I, I still have more stories to tell. And I know Austin feels the same. And so does the cast. So I just wanted to share that. Um, and I thought that was great. And then just to kind of close out the show, Again, there, there is a very weird theme that I did not expect to happen on this show today, um, which is kind of like supporting uh, projects that maybe two white guys should not be talking about on shows. But why not? I, I, well, like, no, no, you're right. No, no, no. I'm I'm taking that back. I'm taking that back. We we should 100% talk about it because mm -hmm. it is important to show that there are people who projects are not geared towards, who can still realize and recognize their importance mm -hmm. and why it is important for us to watch these types of shows, movies, and still put our opinions out there because we can educate others and encourage others who may think that they do not like something to mm -hmm. look at it through a different lens, which therefore ties into what other people are saying about yeah having Latino audiences or, or reviewers or black audiences and black viewers, but collectively we should all be coming together and giving our perspectives on things and why it's important in this process of celebrating representation. Everyone needs to be part of representation. So it's good for uh, the ecosystem. Scott. It is good. It, for the it's yeah. good for the ecosystem. And I think that in the Heights uh, is very good for the ecosystem. The same with Tyler Perry, Zoe's uh, incredible playlist, extraordinary playlist. They're good for the ecosystem of things. They, they, they provide variety, they provide something, and it, but most importantly, they provide an escape and an entertainment. Yeah. And so, um, I think that in, in the Heights, I, I think it's going to do 25 million at the least, uh, and it could do more, um, watching those two little girls dance. Yeah. I, I, I just like, was like, wow. Okay. You know, I'm glad social distancing allowed them to do that. You know, in a crowded theater, it might've been something else, but, and again, they were, they were like not even seven. So um, the only thing that's going to hurt its repeat business is HBO Max because people will see it in the theater and go, wow, that was great. And then they'll go home and watch it again because it's so readily available. Yep. Um, this is a movie I do believe could have gotten a lot of really good theatrical uh uh double viewing. I, like I, I think viewings. musicals in general, like when you have something that, connects to you're gonna <clears throat> in my experience they don't open usually with gangbusters like number mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but they have legs if they're good and they have cat you know like they have either catchy music or they have stories yep. that people latch on to yep. i think they would get, i mean i still think to this day as many as much again as critics have issues with the prom i feel like audiences if that was released in theaters that would have been something like The Greatest Showman that people would have connected to. The characters, mm -hmm. like teenagers watching that, saying, like, mm -hmm. I see myself in these characters. I'm going to go back and I'm going to see this over and over and over again. Yep. Um, and 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 you you are going to lose out on that by having this deal. Um, yeah. Place that I, I will 100% agree on. And before yeah. we close out, because we, we're literally going on to, uh, an hour and a half of this show. Um, Oops. I want to say uh, I got to go to the world premiere of uh, The House Next Door, a.k.a. Meet the Blacks 2. Um, mm -hmm. Again, full disclosure, full disclosure. Uh, I saw the first movie uh, prior to knowing Dion Taylor, and uh, I was not a fan. Uh, not a fan of this movie at all, the, the first one. Um, I went to this one because uh, I am a huge supporter of Dion Taylor. I, I think that what him and his him and his wife Roxanne have done is just inspiring, encouraging, and he just doesn't take no for an answer. And I think he's he's a brilliant voice, and he's growing as a filmmaker. And he's going he's gonna mark my words in the next two to three years. 
he's going to become a household name because mm -hmm. he's taking product projects that he knows are going to push him into the next, you right. know, the next level. And I watched this movie and I, I, again, fully transparent. I went in expecting to hate it because of how I felt about the, the, the first one. I did not hate it. I actually thought it was enjoyable. Um, it was fun, but to his point, when I talked to him at the at the after party, it was made for the community. And when you want, look at these actors, the the Cat Williams and the Mike Apps and the Snoop Dogg, and you see Danny Trejo, and you watch these these actors on screen, you have to think, what does that mean? That might not mean anything to me, but again, for a different audience. That's like, I, I, I'm going to steal this quote. He told me this. I think maybe Sean Edwards said it, but I'm going to just say it. It's like the ghetto Avengers. Like, it's like right. you look at this and you're kind of like, maybe this doesn't mean anything to me, but to the community, seeing these right. actors represented in a movie right. means a lot. Again, Tyler Perry conversation all over again. Yep. There's an audience something. for this, and it's it means something to people, and and it makes people happy. So, I'm not going to shit on this movie. I, I I've I've been improving myself as a as a as a as a reviewer. I've been educating myself. I've been looking at things and saying, maybe this is not for me, but can I see this from another perspective? Is some of the filmmaking aspects of this movie great? No, and I, and I, and I think Dion himself knows that. But it's not the type of movie where you're looking at the movie and you're saying like, oh, that's not a very great, you know, that, that cut wasn't the best cut it could have been. Like, it's not that type of movie. It's it's movie right. where you're like, you have fun, you turn your brain off, and you're just entertained for 90 minutes. So, but that's nice. how it appears if anyone's interested in seeing it. Um, it's, it's made with love. I mean, uh -huh. Hidden Empire put... The money behind it, I know Lionsgate is doing something with it, but like Roxanne, Dion and Roxanne put the money into their projects first. And I mean, no. very few filmmakers do that. And that's only no. because they heard the word no. They heard the word no, and they didn't want to take it for an answer. Yeah. And uh, there's nothing more inspiring than that in Hollywood than someone who heard no a million times and said, you know what? I'm going to do it myself. True so. words. What a, what a great show today. Yeah. I have to say. I, yeah. I hope. Yeah, what a great show today. I'm not patting ourselves on the back. I just think topically, this is stuff. It was a great show today. Good job, Scott. Great show. Thank you. Thank you. Good, yeah, good, you did good, great good too. Thing. I think we had great yeah. conversations. We it's talked about a lot of things. And, and it's all uh, trending in Hollywood. It's all, all trending. Of it. it really is because In the Heights is not trending. That's trending in Hollywood, but it need be discussed. Um, it's flaws, but yet what's so positive? Yeah. Tyler Perry. So great show today. Love All the right. conversation. Thank you. So thank you everyone for tuning in. Please like, comment, share this video. We appreciate all the viewership and all the comments. Uh, and we will see you next Friday at 11 a.m. Thank you. <laughs>